Hey everyone, let me pray for you as we look into God's word. Father, we ask that you would show us the truth of your word, how it applies to us as individuals, and how you want us to walk to bring glory to you. Megan was a relatively new Christian, and she found herself a job in a megachurch, 15,000 plus member megachurch, in the training department. Megan writes that during my time in the training department, a new pastor that was being groomed to replace the founding pastor of the church was brought in to lead the department. Well, at first, Megan was so excited to be able to work with the future lead pastor of this church in the department. But over a little bit of time, Megan began to feel that something wasn't just quite right. She noticed that these, this new pastor rarely ever talked about God, and yet he was going to be leading a church. And then there were times when his, uh, his language and his demeanor was very vulgar and harsh. In fact, one time she says that, that they were in a discussion about a individual that he was in conflict with, and he said, I just want to punch that woman in the beep, beep face. You fill in the blanks. Over time, uh, the vulgarity and the attitude and the hypocrisy began to wear on Megan and she, she just couldn't handle it anymore. She couldn't listen to his sermons when he was speaking because he was so polished and had it so together and was such a great example up on the stage, but behind the scenes he was a totally different person. She was nauseated by the hypocrisy. And eventually Megan just left the church, left going to church because she couldn't take the hypocrisy anymore. The single greatest cause of atheism in the world today is Christians. Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, but walk out of the church doors and deny him with their lifestyle. That is what the world simply finds unbelievable, or we could use the word nauseating. In fact, Jesus agreed in Matthew. Jesus says of the religious leaders and people, he says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of bones and dead and of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Hypocrisy nauseates Jesus. In fact, hypocrisy nauseates ourselves. And yet we could easily say, I'm sure glad that I'm not part of, I'm not one of those Pharisees, but the truth of the matter is, is we struggle with hypocrisy. It's not just a problem in Jesus' day, it's a problem in our day and in our church. Just stop, stop and think about it. Have you ever been with a group of people around a table, maybe at work, maybe in a restaurant? We will get back to restaurants. Uh, maybe it's uh, a standing around talking while watching your kids play sports, or these are the friends that you hang out with. And then topics like, like uh, f getting some sexual pleasure outside of marriage come up, or topics about cheating the government on your taxes, or stealing from work, or, or maybe demeaning the way we talk about men or the way we talk about women or, or gossip is happening and you are so a part of it that the people around you would never guess that you're a follower of Christ by the way you're engaging. That's hypocrisy, isn't it? We're supposed to live one way but we live totally different. Or think about promises we make with our mouths. Yeah, 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 no problem. I'll be at the party. I'll be at the party you can count on. Oh, no, I'll be at the game. You'll see me there. I'll be at the game. Oh, you have to send me that resume, recipe. I just have to make that. No, don't worry about it. I'll get it done. I'll get it done. When in truth, in our heart, we do not intend to be at that party, at that game, get that done, or make that recipe. Isn't that hypocrisy? We're trying to create an image that isn't true. Or how about the time? This has happened to me last night as I was preparing for my <laughs> sermon and going over this, is we, we act with kindness or we say encouraging words or, or we support somebody or we come alongside, you did great in that or this is a great proposal or man, you're so kind, you're so good to people and we, we 
we pump their tires because we want something from them. It's not because we want to encourage them and we're doing it for them. It's because we've got a favor to ask or we want something from them or we want to be accepted by them. And so we pretend we're something that we're not. We say things that don't truly represent our heart. Or how about those of us that are followers of Jesus and yet when it comes to how we at work, we lie about our boss, or we cheat our clients, or we hit on people that are employees. Or we use language that is vulgar and demeaning. We act one way at work, we act one way with our friends, but totally different than what God calls us to act like. You see, hypocrisy nauseates. It nauseated Jesus, it nauseates us. Kerry Newhoff wrote an article, Why Millennials Are Not Returning or Coming to Church. And among the reasons he gives, he said, the, perhaps the biggest one is the hypocrisy. They have watched their parents say one thing at church and live a totally different way at home. Or they've watched church leaders say one thing at church and be totally different in other situations. Or they've watched people say one thing, we believe this, and yet treat people with disrespect or lack of dignity in another situation. That's hypocrisy, and it nauseates. But Jesus, in his upside-down kingdom, calls us to a different kind of living, a different kind of thinking, a different way to live out our faith. In in the Beatitudes, which is the first section of his greatest sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, and this is the sixth Beatitude, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the pure in heart because they will see God. God will reveal himself to them. So what does purity mean? What's a pure heart? Well, usually when we think of purity, we think of clean. We often substitute those words, but they're not the same, really. Uh, Purity means, and its foundational meaning, it means to be unmixed or undivided. It means of one essence. And so something that is pure is not mixed with several things. It's just one essence. You think about hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is living my life one way in front of this group and living in another way in front of that group. It's a divided life, but a pure life, a pure heart, is one that lives the same way regardless of what situation or circumstances a person finds himself. A pure heart is a heart that is the same no matter the circumstances. This was one of David's greatest prayers, but it comes in an odd place until you think it through. David was the greatest, perhaps the greatest, probably was the greatest king of Israel. He lived about 3,000 years ago. God had blessed him with power, with success, with finances, with just about everything you can imagine, God had poured blessing into his life. One day, at probably the apex of his reign. David was a, had seen a woman, a very beautiful woman named Bathsheba, bathing, and he lusted after her, and he called her to his palace. He seduced her, and he made her pregnant. Well, in order to cover up, he called Uriah, her husband, in from the battlefront. He was, Uriah was out fighting David's battles and called him back to Jerusalem and tried to trick him into going home and sleeping with his wife so then they could say the baby was his. But Uriah wouldn't go and after trying to trick him to get him there, David realized he wouldn't go because Uriah said, how could I go home and enjoy the comforts of my bed and the comforts of my wife when my comrades are suffering deprivation out in the field? So David wrote a letter, sealed it with his seal, gave it to Uriah, said, take this to Joab the the general and go back out to the front, which he did. Joab received the letter, broke the seal, read it. It said, put Uriah at the front of where the battle is the fiercest, then pull back so that he's killed, which Joab did and Uriah was killed. David used the power that he had been given, the influence he had been given, the authority he had been given, in order to protect his image. This is where the hypocrisy that nauseated God about this situation was overwhelming. Everything he had, he was given to by God, and he used it to protect an image of himself that wasn't even true, that he was righteous, that he was good, that he was just, that he was fair. He was, and he killed a man in order to keep that image alive, and God was so nauseated by it, he blew the whole thing up, and it went public. Now, this is where the true spirit of David, where we see 
As bad as he was, he also belonged to the upside down kingdom because when his sin comes out, he is broken and he is poor in spirit. He doesn't defend it, he doesn't justify it. He falls before God and he admits what is true of himself before God. He agrees with God what he has done is wrong and despicable and wicked. And then he mourns over that sin. He mourns the sin that he had done and, and he just longs to be cleansed from it. And the, the, this is the prayer I was telling you about. In the midst of that brokenness and in the midst of his sin, this is the prayer that David prays. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Create in me a pure heart. That's David's prayer. God, I was after after sin and I dishonored you and I chose sin over you please change my heart so I'll choose you first then I'll not pursue the things that that are sinful and wicked and despicable and then turn me away from you but I will always pursue you that my heart will be unmixed undivided it will be focused only on you you know that prayer if you were to pray it God would answer too. You know, for some of us, we're in situations where we're being hypocritical. In fact, maybe all of us, when you think about it. We act different among different people to give an image. We say things, we make promises. We have actions and, and habits in our lives that are hypocritical if people knew about them. And were you to pray that prayer, God created in me a pure heart. Just like he answered it with David, so he'll answer it with you. But you've got to pray it about the things in your life. And if you're willing to pray for God to create a clean heart in you, he'll do that in you, just like he did my friend Mike. Now Mike's a faithful ser servant of Christ, but he wasn't always that way. When he was in high school, he was a hypocrite. Uh, Mike said he lived two totally different lives. When he was at school and in sports with his friends, he lived one way. And the things that he said and the things that he did, people would never have guessed that he was a follower of Jesus or that he ever went to church or did anything spiritual. But when he was at home and when he was uh, with his family, Mike was, played the part of the good missionary kid and, and played it so well that the pastor of the church they were attending saw his potential and thought, I'm going to develop Mike and then work with him and eventually ask him to preach during a Sunday evening service. So Mike was up preaching. Meanwhile, three of his friends, good friends from school, who had no idea that he was a Christian or went to church or anything, happened to be driving around in the area looking for something to do, drove by the church while Mike was in there preaching. Unknown to them, Mike was in there preaching. And, and one of them said, he, he said, I always wonder what went on in those places. I dare you to come with me. We'll just walk in and see what's going on in the lake. So they parked the car in the parking lot and got up, walked into the sanctuary while Mike was preaching, and walked in, looked up at the pulpit, and were stopped, stunned. They saw Mike up there preaching. They weren't the only ones that were stunned. Mike said, I saw them walk in, and he goes, I was stunned, caught. His two lives, his two worlds collided. Somehow he stumbled his way through that sermon, but that was where God exposed the truth of the hypocrisy in his life. But that became the place in that exposure where Mike decided he was going to truly follow God, where he prayed for a pure heart, a heart singly devoted to God. So how do you get a pure heart? Well, a pure heart is both given and grown. What do I mean by that? Well, first, it's given. Uh, Jeremiah, a prophet from the Old Testament, says, the heart is deceitful above all things. No one can know it. So we are born into this world with a sinful heart, and it deceives even us. Even we don't know our own hearts at times because it's deceitful. But don't worry about that because Jesus says, I will give you a new heart. In Acts chapter 15, verse 8 and 9, uh, the writer says, God who knows the heart God, who knows our hearts, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. He made their hearts new. He gave them a new heart by faith. 
Well, how do you get a new heart? By faith. Well, faith is the acceptance of what God is offering, offering us. Jesus took our place on the cross and died for our sins, so to pay for them, so that God could now enter into a restored relationship with those who put their faith in Jesus. And through forgiveness of sins and restoration, God creates a new heart within us. He actually puts his own spirit within us. And so we're given a new heart, a new heart to seek God. Now, how, do you, how does a person put faith in Jesus to receive that new heart? Well, this is what the upside down kingdom is about. First, it's about admitting our sin. Saying, God, I admit what you say about me is true, that I'm broken and I'm sinful and I'm separated from you. I'm not gonna justify myself, I'm not gonna explain it away, I'm not gonna ignore you, I'm gonna accept what you say to be true. And then A, that's admit. B, we believe that the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ pays for our sin, is the only thing that can pay for our sin, sin and reconcile us to the Father. And then C, we choose to take our lives and completely surrender it, giving it to God, saying, I believe, I admit I'm a sinner, I believe Jesus' death di died for me and paid for my sin, now I choose to surrender my life and to follow you. Forgive me of my sin. That's what it means to have faith put faith in God, that he has done everything, we need to receive it by faith. Now he puts this new heart within us, but the old heart, the old ways don't go away. We still struggle with those, so we have this new heart and we have this old heart battling with each other, and that's where the grown part, the giving is what God gives to us by faith, but the growing or the nurturing part is something we must do. Well, how do you nurture a heart, a pure heart? Uh, I'm sure you recognize the brand Coke, Coca-Cola, well if you use the word Coke acronym, this is how I remember a lot of things, if you use the word Coke, C-O-K-E, that's an acronym for the things we need to do to nurture this new heart that is within us. C, James chapter four, verse eight, come near to God, C, come, come near to God, and he will come near to you. Now watch this, wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded, how? By coming close to God. Notice the double-minded part is to be divided in your mind, but a pure heart is single-focused on God. So first, how do, you, how do we have a, a, a pure heart? We come near to God. Well, how do you come near to God? That's where our spiritual disciplines come in. Choosing to read and pray and seek God each day of our lives. You know, we claim to be followers of Christ, but if we're not coming near to God, we're never going to hear from Him. We're never going to see Him in our lives. We must make the effort of coming near to Him. And so many of us are so negligent in this area. And maybe that's what God is calling you today, is to just start reading the Word and praying. Start listening to sermons like you're doing now, podcasts, but reading the Word and praying. I'll speak to you. Come near to me. That's the first step of growing a pure heart. Oh, John 14, 21. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me, and the one who loves me is loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Can you guess what O stands for? Obedience. When we obey God, we are saying to God, we love you. We're focused on you. We're not focused on ourselves, our own wants, our own desires. We're first putting you first. That's pure heartedness. And then God says, when you obey me, then I will reveal myself. You will see me. It's the promise of Jesus fulfilled through obedience. Well, how do I know what to obey? Go back to see. Come near to God. That's how we know what to obey as we spend time in the word and in prayer. God God shows us the areas of our lives where we need to obey or steps we need to take in order to grow. And when we obey God, then God reveals himself to us because God longs to be in loving relationship and our obedience shows our love for God. C, come near to God. O, obey. K, Colossians 3, verse 5. Put to death. What's another name for put to death? Kill. Kill, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Then he lists some things, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. They're just a list of some. They're not the only sins that we need to kill. Any sin that controls us, anything that, that, that leads us away from God and makes us a hypocrite and nauseates people because of our actions. You know, uh, if you go to Ephesians, Paul says the way you kill sin in your life is you need to bring it into the light. You need to confess it to people. So we're great at confessing sins to God just between us and God, 
But that doesn't kill sin in us. You need to bring it into the life. That's why things like our restoration prayer ministry, our freedom sessions, our life groups, or personal one-on-one -on -one accountability where you are open and honest with other people and say, this is true of me. As you bring that sin into the light, what happens is it loses its power. You will not kill sin without bringing it into the light. And so if you're not connected with other people where you're honest and true and not hiding what's true about you, but being vulnerable and authentic, and you will begin to create a pure heart because God will destroy that sin as you bring it into the light. And then finally, E. James chapter one, verse two to four. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Trials are another name for hard times because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance or, to fit my Coke word, endurance. Let endurance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. You know, some of the hard times we go through are not because we deserve them, it's because we need them. And God takes us through difficult circumstances that we did nothing to deserve, but God uses them. And sometimes maybe we do deserve them, but regardless of if we deserve it or not, we need them. And God says, I'm taking you through this so that you will grow in your faith. Your heart will become new and pure before me. And you need to endure because if you quit, you don't learn the lesson and I'll only have to take you back through this. So endure, endure, endure. What hard thing are you going through right now that God is calling you to say, endure in this. Endure. Endure that relationship. Endure that falseness. Endure that uh, attack. Endure the difficulty you're going through. Endure the pain. Because it will create in you a pure heart if you're enduring for me. So Megan, disgusted by the hypocrisy, nauseated by it, left the church. But Megan came back. Megan came back because the other people that she'd worked with had reached out to her and gone after her. And she saw in them true love. And their passion for God and other people motivated them to serve faithfully in that church. And it was through them of watching people that were pure in heart, watching people that didn't live two different lives, but what they said and what they did was consistent all the time, that she was captivated by them and realized that one person does not define the church. One person does not define a church. In fact, that pastor eventually became the lead pastor and then resigned uh, secretly. Nobody even understood or knew why he resigned, he just disappeared. Not surprised because probably some of the hypocritical behaviors caught up with them. See, hypocrisy nauseates, but purity always captivates. When people live authentically, when people don't keep hiddenness and don't pretend and don't live two different lives, but, but live one life, I'm not saying live imperfectly because we all have mercy for people who say, this is wrong in my life, I'm sorry, I'm trying to change. We all have mercy for that. That shows a pure heart, a willingness to confess our brokenness. Hypocrisy nauseates, purity always captivates. And so when we think about the vision that we have as a church, that God has given us, double our impact as a church in this area so that we can reach people and share with people, invite people into relationship with Jesus Christ, that they might receive the forgiveness of sins and new life and a new heart within them as we go, go and invite people, whether they want to come or not is their choice, but as we engage in the vision that God has given us, and he leads us to the people that he's working in and knocking on the door of their heart, we cannot be hypocrites because hypocrisy will turn people away, but purity captivates them. Hypocrisy nauseates, purity captivates, and it's by living sincerely and truly with a heart for God, a pure heart, that people are drawn to God through you. Well, has God put his finger on any hypocrisy in your life today? Maybe some practices you have that are hidden. Maybe some things you do at work, the way you treat other people. 
Maybe it's the way you are at home, the things you're watching on TV or your screens, the way you speak about your husband, the way you speak about your wife, the way you speak about other people. You know, people are always watching. And David's prayer was as effective for him as it is for you and I. Create in me a pure heart, God. In fact, I'm going to ask you to just bow your head wherever you are right now. Just close your eyes and pray. Create in me a pure heart, God, by. Create in me a pure heart, God, by. What is it he needs to change? What is it you need to confess? What is it that needs to be different in your life? Who do you need to go to? Who do you need to talk to? What needs to be done? Create in me a pure heart, God, by giving me the courage to confess my sin. Create in me a pure heart, God, by by giving me the the strength to lay aside that bitterness in my heart toward that person. Create in me a pure heart, God, so that I won't stop cheating people and live and speak in truth. What is it? Create in me a pure heart, God, by you fill in the blank. Father, as people pray this prayer, I pray for your mercy. And may the joy of salvation fill the hearts of those that are calling to you. Whether people are calling to you for the first time to say, I want that new heart, I want to be right with God. Or whether they have prayed that prayer in the past but have been living a life that is nauseating to you and others around them. But they want a pure heart. They want to be captivating people and, 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 and drawing people to you. Would you hear the prayer and change our hearts? Amen. Amen.